Something that I always will remember is the PlayStation sound. As soon as it starts, you just knew. You just knew it was going to be a good time. During the early 90s, the dominating brands of the video gaming world were Sega, which plays over a hundred exciting high-tech games with high-quality graphics, and Nintendo. The ultimate challenge is waiting. That was about to all change in 94. At the end of 1994, Sony introduced the PlayStation game console to the world. Well, to Japan anyway. Then, in 1995, the rest of the world got a taste. Yes, friends, I'm talking about this. It may look like a harmless bagel toaster, but inside is a deadly donut. It eventually went on to sell over 100 million units. It carries these telltale signs. It was born from the idea of Sony employee Ken Kutaragi who went on to become known as the father of the PlayStation. This was the first console I remember actually going into a shop with my dad and getting for either my birthday or Christmas sometime. I was extremely excited to go home and play it. The first game I really remember playing was V-Rally. And then I found some long-time favourites, such as the Driver series, Metal Gear Solid, Surveillance camera? The original GTA games. Destruction Derby. Abe's Odyssey. And Soul Blade, which takes the title of being the first video game I ever completed. I had my first ever panic attack playing Resident Evil 2 when I was a kid. But we won't talk about that. As a games console, this played such a pivotal role towards my attitude and my love for gaming growing up. This is my my actual original PlayStation 1 <laughs> that's covered in Final Fantasy VIII stickers. I just remember seeing the colours and the actual gameplay, how fast it was and the music, the sound, and I was just completely blown away. The main thing that I immediately uh, noticed was the controller. I, I remember sitting down just, just holding it and just moving both sticks around for ages and ages just just, just staring at it even before I turned it on. I, I, was, I was fascinated by it. It was giving me thumbgasms. I'm pretty sure it was Christmas 97 that we got a PlayStation 1. We borrowed a, a neighbor's Super NES. So coming from, from that to a PlayStation we have like proper 3D graphics. Very, very different to anything that I know I'd ever played. My parents came home, my dad gave me a magazine and it was a PlayStation magazine and it had a demo disc and I said to him, I can't use this, I don't have a PlayStation. And he's like, well, <laughs> just in luck. And so he, he, came, he went off and he came back and they bought out a box and it was a PlayStation. I didn't even know I wanted a PlayStation, but here I had one. I remember seeing Mega Man 8, like, you know, uh, specifically Clown Man stage with all the balloons and like the carnival background. And I was just blown away. It looked really cool. I was like, all right, time to get it. I'm excited, right? And then all of a sudden I realize it says PSX. And I'm like, what? What's a PSX? It started life as a CD add-on for a Nintendo console. But after the deal fell through, Sony reworked it and turned it into the PlayStation console that we know and love today. The launch price was famously announced at E3 in 1995. Anyways, join me for a brief presentation.
299. The PlayStation has an R3000 33 megahertz MIPS RISC CPU, 2 megabytes of RAM and 1 megabyte of video RAM, and it stores saved games on an external memory card that you plug in the front. There's something about a console that's not on the net that's just completely off grid. You use memory cards and you just enjoy the moment. You just put in a game, you play. There was nothing, there was no online, there was no, you know, microtransactions, there was no extra, you know, you wouldn't have to download updates. You put the game in, the game is complete, and you play it. There was nothing else to it. The PlayStation memory cards were quite small in available storage size, and people eventually needed more space, and didn't want to delete their precious saves, or had games that took up multiple save slots, and obviously didn't want to delete them. There were 15 blocks available per card, and they quickly filled up. To remedy this, third-party companies started coming out with multiple paged memory cards. They weren't all that reliable though. There was even a floppy disk drive add-on, so you could store your saves onto floppies or a computer. Games were just more fun that way. It was so simple. You know, your friends would come over, they'd bring their memory cards, they'd plug in their memory cards and you continue their, their game and they could take it home and continue and you could continue and... It was just a fun, pure gaming experience really did help me throughout my university years because I, I come from Gibraltar and it's a very small community and going to the UK to study I felt homesick quite a bit as you can imagine so um, I spent many many hours playing on the PlayStation 1. The first game that I played was a medieval game demo now I can tell you right I played the L out of that I got a PlayStation 1 for Christmas with Mega Man X4. So that was my first game. And I instantly fell in love. I actually bought uh, the game on a, a remaster on PS4 uh, and I've actually finally completed it. it was uh, That actually completed that experience for me. You know, it was stepping back into them young gamer shoes again and, and, and kind of going through all that. I remember playing a game called uh, Disneyland Racing, which probably not many people know, but I enjoyed the hell out of that game because me and my brother would just sit around playing this Disney game. We both really enjoyed going to Disneyland and being able to play and race around the various rides. We played the Final Fantasy VIII demo about 17 times. And then eventually I finally got a copy of the game, started it and stopped it and restarted it like another 17 times and then forgetting where I was at after the holidays were over and then having to start all over again. I remember reading about a particular game called Metal Gear Solid by Hideo Kojima, uh, produced by Konami. And just reading about this game, I was completely amazed. Zell was my boyfriend. All this stealth around it. I'd never seen uh, a game like that before. And Squall was my boyfriend the graphics, but more importantly, the gameplay. And Cypher was also my boyfriend. That, that magazine, which is here, edition number 42 of the PlayStation magazine. And Irvine was just like a creeper. No one wanted anything to do with him. Don't worry about him. There is at least 10 pages or so in this magazine of uh, the Metal Gear Solid game, which you can see here. In my fan fictions, that I wrote several of. I still read it to date every now and again because it was so influential for me and it meant so much. And the, and the demo that came with that magazine was just something completely out of this world for me. I remember having with the PlayStation 1, the original demo one, that had a lot of awesome games on it. I really remember the, the dino tech having control of like a pretty well for the time you know uh realistic dinosaur and being able to move it and make it snarl and move it around and stuff was just something very different to what you know you'd ever had experiences of before the attention to detail that Hideo Kojima has in any of his games it's just incredible I, and I've never seen anything like it just like when Snake is breathing outside and you can see the steam coming out of his mouth because it's cold or the footsteps that he leaves or uh, how he can actually catch a cold if he's outside for too long, and you know, all these little things. Are, 
details that I had never seen before in any type of game. I'm a huge movie fan, and for me to play a game that's basically like a movie is just incredible. What really grabbed my attention at the time was it's CD-based. Physical media of discs. I mean, that was one thing because you had to keep it clean. Now, I come from like an N64. I had a cartridge. These, these things were robust. Discs, not so much. They scratch. It makes a hell of a noise. It's a learning curve as a kid. You're like, all right, I've got to look after my games because they weren't going to last forever. If you treated them like crap, then, then they'd be ruined. My favourite memory with the console was flawlessly applying this beautiful selection of stickers. They haven't even peeled at all since, since I put them on several moons past. There's so many good PlayStation 1 games. One of them is definitely this. I've got a coaster of it, which is Gran Turismo. Now, Gran Turismo 1 and Gran Turismo 2 they're probably, I'll probably have to give them as the title of my favourite PS1 games because they were just so encapsulating. The whole 3D driving thing, it really got me into cars at a young age. The whole racing to get money to upgrade your car thing, from what I experienced, really, really did um, lay within Gran Turismo. It also gave me a really good car knowledge, so I ended up learning what a lot of makes of cars were and all of that stuff from that. You know, we have the Final Fantasy series, we have Alundra, we have Tekken, we have Wild Arms, just so many games. It's it's just endless, it's crazy. Spyro the Dragon. Spyro. I remember playing Spyro. What a game. Freaking love Spyro, so good. Mental Gear Solid, I still play to date. I must have finished this game, I don't know how many times, probably a hundred times. Crash Bandicoot. A Crash Bandicoot. Crash Bandicoot, uh, Tony Hawk's one and two. I had a shitload of Crash Bandicoot. Going through the levels and getting frustrated, trying to beat them, which were quite difficult at the time. Crash Bandicoot, man, there's so many classic PlayStation games. Resident Evil 2 that also left an impression we had never seen a horror game like that before. Toy Story 2. To this day, uh, one of the most enjoyable storylines. For me, it was just, it was just a, amazing. It had the right amount of of everything um there's just something about it that really really stood out for me and i don't think a lot of people would even remember it bloody raw <laughs> i think bloody raw is one of the most underrated fighting games me and my brother used to love that game and, and it's incredible v rally me and my my slightly older brother we used to we used to race each other on that all the time and it was a really good game that and gran turismo grand theft auto and the uh the london one as well the old uh, top down running around nicking cars <laughs> just shooting up it, it was great you know i mean it's a great bit of fun tomb raider was a big one i, I love playing tomb raider um especially when you get the raptors and i'd have a friend over who, you know who, who lived across the road and she'd come over and we'd play uh, tomb raider and we'd just slowly get through the levels and my brother would be there and we'd all just sit around the tv just sort of freaking out because you know to like bunch of 10 year olds it was actually a bit scary pandemonium pandemonium was also some crazy game driver you know fear effect there are countless number of games that i could mention croc legend of the gobos what a game <laughs> just a really good game with amazing sound lines and sound tags and stuff in it and uh, phrases but uh, I remember playing that a lot because it was one of the games that my uh, that my that my late mum absolutely loved. So we played that a lot. I had a lady friend, but not a girlfriend. She, she was my first mate, and we we spent a lot of time together. But then she actually she moved away uh, when I was quite young, and I didn't see her for uh, a couple of years. All, all of a sudden, my mum invited me to uh, take a trip, you know, and and uh, and visit her again. I went up to see her uh, for, you know, like maybe once or twice a year for a few years. One of the most memorable experiences for me was spending God knows how much time on Spyro. Probably spent more time playing Spyro than we did really doing anything else. Uh, we were Spyro friends. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else had that experience, but I certainly did, yeah, uh, Spyro friends. Many different model revisions were made during its lifetime starting with the SCPH-1000 in Japan, the 1001 in the US and Canada, and the 1002 for power regions, all of which included RCA outputs, a serial port, 
and a parallel port on the back. After a few more model revisions, Sony eventually dropped the parallel port completely, and with the release of the PS1 console in the year 2000, they dropped the remaining serial port too. Now, the PS1 Slim, my dad, which I thank him for, was an absolute legend and he bought me a PS1 Slim and there was actually a screen that attached to it. still have a PlayStation 1 to date. I actually have the mini version with its own um, screen. So it's kind of like a portable version. We moved a little, a little way away from where my dad was and where I used to live. So there used to be frequent car journeys that used to be over an hour long. So when my dad bought me this, it, it enabled me to be able to sit in the back of a car because there was the power that was plugged into the cigarette lighter and I could actually still play PlayStation in the back of the car. My brother and sister were definitely jealous. Don't, I still let them play, of course. During this time, there were of course other consoles for debugging and development usage, but growing up as a kid, I never had access to these or even knew about their existence. The beautiful matte black coloured Neti Rose was released for those who wanted to try their hand at developing a PlayStation game at home. <laughs> I know it's initially made for development uses, but uh, all I really want is that like unlocked ability to read all region game. Japanese imports are like usually what I gravitate towards. The real reasons I picked one up actually is because I like the matte black finish. It's really nice in the touch and the feel. And uh, the controller is also very nice. It's the same kind of material. It's right here. So. As you may have noticed, Sony used to produce the PlayStation in mainly a grey colour, with a few exceptions sprinkled in here and there. I wonder why they didn't make a limited edition pink one, like they did with the PlayStation 2. As the years went on, the PlayStation's disc reading laser would wear out. People would be flipping the console around just to get it to read a disc. I come from the N64 uh, to the PlayStation and sometimes when the games or the console didn't load, you used to turn it off, remove the cartridges and blow into them. Well, I actually attempted to do the same thing uh, with a disc. Uh, in the PlayStation, I actually took the disc out, I blew over the disc. I remember having to turn it upside down just to play Smackdown 2 and avoid the dreaded please insert a PlayStation format disc screen or just being thrown into the audio CD player. I think the wait time between the Sony Computer Entertainment and PlayStation logo screen that meant the game was likely to boot successfully might be what gave me anxiety. Playing on the console was a breeze with so many options for controlling the games. There were the initial normal controllers, then there were the DualShock controllers with analog sticks, and then what followed was a whole host of different peripherals, from a multi-tap device to connect more controllers to one port, to light guns for shooting games, various arcade style joysticks, a whole host of third party controllers. They're the ones that your friend used to give you when you'd go over to play a game with them. They'd have the official one and you'd get the Franken monster. There was also a music making control surface, driving accessories, and even a mouse. In the UK and other countries, there was an official PlayStation magazine that came out each month and had a free demo disc on the front. The magazine would review games and talk about various PlayStation related things, but I was always most interested in a demo disc. These gave people the chance to experience new games that were in development or newly released with a demonstration version, or sometimes a video of the game in question. The magazine became the best-selling video game magazine in the world and ran for 108 issues from November 1995 to March 2004. There was this one little bit and it was like, if you get stuck, call this number for some help and it costs whatever it is per minute. I was really young and I was staying over at my nan and granddad's and I was like begging my granddad, I was like, granddad, I'm stuck on this level, I love this game, let me call him. And he was like, nope, you can figure it out. <laughs> and I'm really glad that he did because that taught me to, to persevere with games and, and not to give up. 
A popular device for the console was for applying cheats to games. These devices plugged into the parallel port on the back of the console and let you scroll through and enable cheats for the game of your choice, whether it be unlimited health, money or something else. Later there were also CD swap versions and versions that contained the ability to play games from other regions. I remember it plugged into the rear right of the PlayStation, like the expansion port, and um, it let you play copied games. Um, and it worked for the most part. It was very temperamental and you had to put like a spring in the um, the CD tray to like keep the tray up, but to keep the button pressed down to make it think that the lid was closed. So it would like try and read the disc. Now, I don't think I can cover the PlayStation without mentioning mod chips. When I was younger, everybody knew a guy who for a small fee could solder a mod chip inside your console to make it play foreign games. And let's be honest here, the most common reason people get a mod chip back then was to play copied games. And nowadays, with collectors wanting to preserve discs as much as possible and with the ease of copying them, it could be argued that it makes sense for preservation perhaps. Otherwise, you've always got optical drive emulation options such as the SIO or X station. However, mod chips didn't always work as expected. As more people got chips, more developers started creating ways to detect and deter the piracy. One of the most well-known games for this is Spyro Year of the Dragon. The game would let you get to a certain point and then you would be presented with a message telling you that your game is pirated. It corrupts your save, it, uh, it makes things ridiculously hard, it, it screws you over basically. With its few flaws, countless awesome game releases, various peripherals, small memory cards and sometimes temperamental disc reader, the PlayStation 1 is definitely my favourite console. Maybe because of the games, maybe because of the memories I have with it. But either way, it'll always have a special place in my heart. As I'm sure it will with many other people too. Sony PlayStation! Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> The PlayStation 1 console sold over 100 million and paved the way for Sony in the video game market, with them going on to develop and release a PlayStation 2 in the year 2000, which at the time of recording this holds the record for the highest selling console with over 155 million units sold. Sony have since released a PS3, PS4 and a PS5, all with great success. It was just a fun, pure gaming experience, which I think is what made Made, which made it great, made, made it a great console to have, made it a console that's lasted generations. They're the important things, I think, when it comes to PlayStation. What those core ideals were in the, in the original iteration of it, where you just plug in a game and play. And it's just fun. There's no need to be any more than that. Hello, Mr. Fuzzy. I hope you enjoy this recording. Fantasy 8 solved. Complete solution. The only guide you'll ever need to... The only... <laughs> it's called... It's called... Fantasy... <laughs> Fuzzy, I'm sorry! Oh my god, these bloopers. Um, <laughs> I'm a little out of focus, I apologise. My camera's like a potato camera. I hope I'm dressed all right. You know, like Rick shirt, Rick hat. Maybe you should have done a documentary on uh, Rick and Morty. I think I might have had more to say. Um. Oh, I'm so hard. Of Thanks, Fuzzy Menace, for asking me to do this. It was so. It was. It was kind of fun going back through and and talking to my friend about it to try to remember what like what we even played and and when. And um, yeah. Anyway, my name's Kerry, or Kid Kerrigan, or Nina Nikolic. I'm a voice actor and a Twitch partner. So you can find me here at my desk or over there inside my booth. And I never leave this place, ever. You can edit this part out. Oh man, sorry about that. I, I'm gonna be a blur for the next the remainder of the video, I apologize.
Love you, bye.